Commissioner, the next witness is Mr Kieran Ford, F-O-R-D-E. Yes, Mr Ford, would you come into the witness box, please? Mr Ford, would you prefer to take an oath or would you prefer to make an affirmation? Affirmation. Affirm the witness, please. I solemnly and sincerely... I solemnly and sincerely... Declare and affirm... Declare and affirm... That the evidence I shall give... That the evidence I shall give... Will be the truth... Will be the truth... The whole truth... The whole truth... And nothing but the truth... And nothing but the truth. Do sit down, Mr Ford. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner. Would you state your full name, please? Uh, Kieran Miles Ford. And, Mr Ford, are you the Head of Wealth Solutions and Partnerships at Australia and New Zealand Banking Group Limited? Yes, I am. Is your business address 833 Collins Street, Docklands? Yes, it is. Uh, have you made a written statement in response to questions asked by the Royal Commission dated the 12th of April 2018? I have. And have you made a supplementary statement dated the 23rd of April 2018? Yes, I have. Have you received a summons, Mr Ford, to appear before the Royal Commission to give evidence and to produce signed statements? Yes, I have. You have that summons with you, Mr Ford? I do. Ford? I tender the summons, Commissioner. Exhibit 2.193, the summons to Mr Ford. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Mr Ford, do you have your statement there dated the 12th of April 2018? Yes, I do. Could you turn, please, to paragraph 77 at page 19? Yes. Uh, Mr Ford, do you see that the third sentence commencing, no communications have been sent? Yes, I do. Was that position correct at the time you signed your statement on the 12th of April 2018? It, it was at the time, yes. Has there been a subsequent development? Uh, yes, so f uh, five of the customers, um, subject to the, um, the um, um, nomination of death form, uh, five of those customers have been contacted uh, and four of those documents have now been re-executed. And Mr Ford, the five customers that you uh, refer to, are they the five customers referred to in paragraph 74A of your statement on page 18? Yes, that's correct. Thank you, Mr Ford. Uh, subject to that matter, are the contents of your statement dated 12 April 2018 true and correct? Yes, they are. Uh, Commissioner, I tender that statement, which is produced in response to the summons, together with the exhibits. The statement of 12 April 18 and exhibit, exhibit 2.194. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr Ford, do you have there your supplementary statement dated the 23rd of April 2018? I do, yes. Uh, are the contents of that statement true and correct? Yes, they are. Commissioner, that statement is also produced and I tender it, together with the exhibit. A supplementary statement of 23 April 18 and its exhibit will be exhibit 2.195. The Commission pleases. Is all. Mr Ford, you've been put forward by ANZ to give evidence about improper conduct by five financial advisers. Yes, I have. And that improper conduct includes forging customer signatures or initials, misappropriating customer funds and misleading or deceiving customers. Yes, it does. I want to ask you about the conduct of one of those advisers, uh, who I will refer to as Mr A. I understand you know who I am referring I do, to yes. when I refer yes. to Mr A. Mm -hmm. um, uh, an order is in place that prevents us from referring to him by name. Uh, Mr A became an authorised representative of Millennium 3 Financial Services in 2009. That's correct. And Millennium 3 is one of the ANZ aligned dealer groups. Yes. Uh, he was a director of a company which was a corporate authorised representative of Millennium 3? That's right. Okay. Uh, and in February 2011, Millennium 3 conducted an audit of Mr A's practice? Um, yes, there was three audits, I think, in my documents. Yes. Well, could I take you to the February 2011 audit, which is Exhibit 7 to your statement, ANZ 800... 2674827 Yes, I have that here. We 
we see from this letter, uh, Mr Ford, which is dated the 1st of April 2011, that there was a review on the 10th of February 2011. Do you see that above the table? Yes, that's right. Uh, and five files of Mr A's were reviewed? That's correct. And for all five files that were included in the audit, Mr A received a rating of very poor advice? That's right. Was that the lowest possible rating? Uh, I think it was, yes. And the audit report notes underneath the table that as a consequence of this review of his advice and advice processes, he's been assessed as representing a higher risk. Yes. Did uh, Millennium 3 take any steps to increase its supervision and monitoring of Mr A after this audit report? Um, I think a, a couple of things happened. Um, the first being that uh, these particular files were um, remediated um, and I understand throughout this time he was also on vetting for certain types of advice. Was he placed on vetting for certain types of advice as a result of these audit results? Um, I believe so. Not 100% sure. Okay. Uh, did Mr A face any disciplinary consequences as a result of these audit results? Uh, not, not that I've seen, no. No. And in June and July 2011, following this audit, Mr A told a number of his clients about an investment opportunity? That's right. And could I take you to Exhibit 31 in your statement, which is... Uh, ANZ 800 4010860. This is a lengthy um, email chain. But can I ask you to uh, turn to 0869? And if we could have 0869 and 0870 on the page, to, on the screen together. This is an example of an email that Mr A sent to a number of his clients, his Millennium 3 clients. Yes. Uh, and you can see, but we can't because it's been redacted, that Mr A sent this email with a footer that showed he was sending it in his capacity as managing director of the corporate advice entity that was an authorised representative of Millennium 3. Yes, he did. Uh, he described himself as an authorised representative of Millennium 3 and provided his Australian Financial Services licence number in that block that we have redacted. Yes. Uh, and at 0869 we see that the email related to a potential investment by Mr A's clients uh, in a property. Uh, the location of the property has also been redacted. It was a property in a particular marina. Is that right? Yes, correct. Uh, and we see that Mr A tells his clients in this email that the initial sale price for that property was over $2 million, uh, but he had negotiated a purchase price of $1.655 million. Yes. And there was a 30% cash deposit required plus stamp duty. Yes. And do you see the reference there to him needing 600000 from investors? Yes. Uh, representing the deposit and the stamp duty and a further sum? Yes. Now, uh, can I take you to another page within this same exhibit, which is 0873, and we see a bit more detail of the proposal that Mr A made to his clients. Uh, this email again, the signature block is removed, but it's another email sent by Mr A in his capacity as managing director of the advice entity that was an authorised representative of Millennium 3. Yes, I just... Um, sorry, could you give me the... 0873. 0873.
Yes, that's right. Yes, so again, the uh, email footer describes Mr A as an authorised representative of Millennium 3 and his Australian Financial Services licence number is displayed. Yes, it does, yes. Now, this is an earlier email, slightly earlier in time than the last email I took you to. This is dated the 28th of June 2011, but it's sent to the same clients who received the earlier email. Is that right? That's right, yes. Yes. And can you see here that what uh, Mr A said to his clients was that there was a secure complex uh, that was the marina. He provides information about uh, a particular property available for sale in the um, marina. He explains that it's never been on the market. It was sold in 2007 for 2.25 million off the plan by the owner to his mate who couldn't end up settling. And Mr A says, I know the developer of the project and the owner. Uh, and he explains that he's negotiated a sale price of $1.655 million with settlement in 18 months. It's generally time to buy when the market is down. And the deal will be to invest $600,000 to pay for the deposit, the stamp duty and to furnish it for sale. We would then put it on the market for $2.05 million to $2.099 million and accept as little as 1.9 after fees. Do you see those references? Yes. So this is the information that Mr A was providing to his clients about this investment opportunity. Yes. Are financial advisors permitted to provide advice to customers to invest in particular properties? Uh, no. No? No, not this, not under this authorisation, no. I'm but sorry, Mr Ford, you dropped your voice. Do you mind speaking up a little? Uh, sorry, uh, no, not under this authorisation. Yes. But Mr A convinced five of his clients to invest in this property through their self-managed superannuation funds? Yes. And they were self-managed superannuation funds establ established on his recommendation and with his assistance? Yes, that's right. And four of the clients invested $100,000 each and the fifth invested $200,000? Yes, that's right. And Mr A told these clients that the way to structure this investment was to set up a unit trust? Um, that's certainly the way it was structured. I just can't recall the reference to that. Well, the clients believed, didn't they, Mr Ford, that when they paid their $100,000 or their $200,000, they were subscribing for units in a unit trust that would acquire this property? That's, that's right, yes. OK. Could I ask you to turn to Exhibit 12 of your statement? Uh, ANZ 800 4010436. Another email chain, uh, Mr Ford. And could I ask you to turn within that exhibit to 0531? see that on the 17th of August 2011, Mr A emailed his clients to tell them that the purchase of the property had taken place. Do you see that? Yes. We now own an investment property. Yes. And Mr A said uh, further down that the property would be completely furnished and ready for sale within six to eight weeks. Yes. Um, <coughs> He also says in this email that he looks forward to a sale uh, somewhere around Christmas time. Do you see that reference? Yes. Now, um, the clients who had uh, invested this money on Mr A's recommendation heard very little from Mr A about this property for the next 18 months. Um, I think that's right, yes. And in November 2011, Millennium 3 conducted another audit of Mr A. Yes. And you've annexed that audit report to your statement. It's Exhibit 8, ANZ 800 267 4835. 
and this is the result of that audit. We see that the audit was conducted on the 24th of November 2011 and the, report, the results were reported to uh, Mr A on the 7th of December 2011. Yes. And of the five files that were reviewed, Mr A received a rating of very poor advice for four of them and poor advice for the fifth. Correct, yes. And this again resulted in Millennium 3 assessing Mr A as representing a higher risk to Millennium 3 than an average Millennium 3 advisor or practice. Yes. So this was now twice in one year that Mr A had received extremely poor audit results and had been identified by Millennium 3 as higher risk. Yes, that's right. Did Millennium 3 take any steps at this time to increase its level of supervision and monitoring of Mr A as a result of these audit results? Not that I've been able to determine apart from the remediation of the five files concerned um, uh, and, and some pre-vetting that was happening during this, during this period. Did Mr A face any disciplinary consequences as a result of this second uh, extremely poor audit result? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Why not? I don't know. Then in August 2012, Millennium 3 audited Mr A again. You've annexed that audit report as Exhibit 9 to your statement. Uh, ANZ 800-267-4819. Yes. And in this shows us that there was an audit on the 2nd of August 2012 which was communicated, the results of which were communicated to Mr A on the 15th of August 2012? Yes. Um, uh, and we see again that five files were reviewed and two were rated very poor advice, one was rated poor advice and two were rated sound advice. Yes. Now, one of the issues raised in this audit was that Mr A had provided self-managed superannuation fund advice without submitting it for pre-vetting. Do you agree with that? That's right, yes. Okay. Uh, could we then turn to your Exhibit 10, ANZ 800-308-5037, an email chain from uh, dates between the 31st of August and the 5th of September 2012. Yes. And could we start with uh, 5040, the last email in the chain, the first in time. Mm -hmm. On the 31st of August 2012, the date is above the Millennium 3 banner there, we see that Mr Jonathan Nguyen, the State Development Manager for WA, for Millennium 3 Financial Services, sent an email noting that he had reviewed the August 2012 audit report and setting out his concerns. Yes. And he noted a number of options moving forward, including recommendation for termination of authority. Yes. And then if we move through the email chain at 05, uh, at, sorry, at 5037 to 5038, mm -hmm. if we could have both of those on the screen, we see that a short time later, on the 5th of September 2012, down the bottom of the first page, um, Mr Nguyen recommended that Mr A be let go. Do you see that email that starts at the bottom of the first page and continues to the top of the second page? Yes. Yep. And That's on the right. same day, we see on the left-hand side that the Joint Managing Director, Mr Martin, agreed. Yes. Um, Mr A was then suspended. Is that right? Yes, he was. He was given 28 days' notice of Millennium 3's intention to terminate his authorised representative agreement. That's right. And did Millennium 3 at this time conduct an investigation into Mr A's client files to see whether any of his customers had been given inappropriate advice? Uh, not to my knowledge. Why not? I don't know. Given Mr A's 
very poor audit results, wasn't it likely that there might have been clients who suffered some detriment because of his advice? Uh, yes, I think, I think we should have, um, the business should have reviewed a further number of files at, at the time of, of these reports. But instead what the business did was terminate uh, Mr A and take no further action in relation to his client files? Uh, that, that appears to be the case, yes. And while this was going on, in June 2012, Mr A's clients who had been given the investment opportunity entered into a deed establishing a unit trust? Yes. And each of those clients who contributed money towards the purchase of the property in the marina uh, received units in the trust matching their contribution? Uh, I believe so, yes. But what they didn't know was that Mr A had not purchased the property in the name of the trust? That's right. Um, he'd used the money to purchase the property in the name of a company of which he was the sole director. That's right. Now, could I show you Exhibit 33 to your witness statement, ANZ 800 401 Just make sure I have that. Ah, oh, yes. Um, we need to move to the move within that document to 0657. This is a lengthy exhibit again, Mr. Ford. But at 0657, we see the contract for sale. Um, a number of parts of this are redacted, but I think you have an unredacted version which shows that the um, buyer of the property was not the unit trust, but the corporate entity associated with uh, Mr A. Yes, that's right. Uh, and on further down that page, we see that an amount of $496,500 was payable at settlement with the balance of the purchase price payable in February 2013. Do you see that? Yes. And it shows further down that Mr A, as the sole director of the corporate buyer, guaranteed payment of the initial $496,500, which was funded by his clients. That's, that's right. Now, in September 2013, so the um, the deed establishing the unit trust is June 2012 um, and we've just seen the contract of sale. In September 2013, Millennium 3 received a complaint from some former clients of Mr A. Yes, I've... And you've annexed that complaint to your statement. It's Exhibit 12, ANZ 800 4010436. If I could ask you to turn within that exhibit to 0437, we see the complaint letter. Yes. Perhaps if we could have 0437 and 0438 on the screen at the same time. The identity of the complainants has been redacted, but these are you know, Mr Ford, different clients to the clients who made the investment in the property? Um, it may be that they were, I'm sorry, I'm, I may be wrong about that, Mr Ford, they may have also been um, clients who were one of the investors in the property. Are you able to say? Uh, they, I'm almost certain they are. Yes. They are, yes. Thank you. And we see that uh, the um, complainants in this letter, which is written to Millennium 3, in the uh, second paragraph down, advise that the purpose of the letter is to advise you that we have a complaint relating to the loss of $100,000 withdrawn from the fund's um, uh, account 
by way of a cheque made payable to a corporate company, a corporate entity associated with Mr A on or about the 2nd of August 2011. Yes. So right. this is uh, one of the clients who invested $100,000 in the marina purchase. Yes. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. And the uh, complainants make clear that the complaint relates to losses they have incurred directly arising from the conduct of Mr A's company and Mr A in their capacity as authorised representatives of Millennium 3. Yes. And on the following page, we see that the complainants um, advise that they have recent emails from Mr A advising that their $100,000 has been lost because after being on the market for the last two years, the apartment has not sold and the apartment is now estimated to have a bank valuation of 1.2 million, around 1 million less than the initial sale price and 900,000 less than the asking price referred to in the email they received from Mr A. Yes. And the right. monies due under the mortgage are now greater than the bank valuation. That's right. And they also note that until recently it was their understanding that the trustee of the unit trust had acquired the apartment, but recent searches of Landgate and ASIC solvency notices have revealed that the registered proprietor of the apartment is Mr A's corporate entity. That's right, yep. Um, if we turn to 0439, we see that the clients advise Millennium 3 in the first full paragraph that the rosy picture painted in the emails sent on 25 July 2011 and subsequent telephone call was that the apartment would be resold for a significantly higher price within a short time frame. It is now clear that the suggestion to purchase the apartment was at best reckless and the probability of someone achieving the returns outlined by Mr A was very low if not impossible. And further down the page, at the bottom, there is a request by these clients for a payment from Millennium 3, being reimbursement of the amounts that they've expended and a further amount as an allowance for interest that would have accrued if the funds had not been withdrawn. Yep, that's right. And on the 19th of December, Millennium 3 formally responded to this complaint. Yes, I'm not sure about the date, but we can... 0574 within this exhibit is the formal response. Mr Ford? <coughs> yes. And if we could have 0576 and 0 Five seven seven on the screen. First, before we do that, I'll just direct your attention to the request for payment from the clients. You requested payment of 110,000, which comprises the 100,000 you used to purchase the units and 10,000 for interest. Then if we could look at Millennium 3's response to that at 0576 and 0577. Um, under you, your claim that you have suffered a loss, Millennium 3 pointed out that the complaint relates to losses which you alleged to have suffered as a result of investing $100,000 in the unit trust for the pur purpose of purchasing an apartment. And then at 0577, under conclusion, <coughs> It is unclear to us whether a loss has been suffered by you at all in respect of Mr A's conduct. However, if you provide the information requested, we will review the matter again and subsequently provide you with a response to your complaint. Why was it unclear whether these clients had suffered a loss as a result of Mr A's conduct? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure why it was unclear at the time. Um, You have been put forward by ANZ to deal with these events, Mr Ford. Yes. But uh, have you made inquiries to attempt to understand these events? Um, 
I have. I've, I've, I've read right through the complaints material and um, have, have made inquiries, but I haven't been able to, to my satisfaction, get a response to that question. I see. So after Millennium 3 sent this letter, in December 2013 and January 2014, um, it identified four other self-managed super funds that were listed as being unit holders in the unit trust and who were also customers of Mr A when he was an authorised representative of Millennium 3. That's right. It was um, derived from the material in the complaint and then Millennium 3 saw that and, and went, went part way to investigate um, or some of the way to investigate whether those customers were in fact customers of, um, of um, Mr Ray's. Did Millennium 3 or ANZ attempt to contact those customers? Not to my knowledge. Did it investigate whether any of those customers had suffered any loss? Uh, not to my knowledge. Why not, Mr Ford? I don't know. Um, why didn't ANZ... Um, uh, well, let me ask this first. Did ANZ have access to the customer files of Mr A? Um, no, they didn't. Millennium 3, uh, and there's evidence here in my exhibits, tried um, very hard once they got the complaint from the customer, tried very hard through Mr A um, and through Mr A's new licensee um, and also through uh, a liquidator as well, tried very hard to uh, get the files uh, to enable them to um, uh, respond to the complaint fully. Um, weren't successful in getting those files back. So why didn't ANZ, through Millennium 3, ensure that it retained copies of the customer files when it terminated Mr A's authorised representative status? Yeah, I don't know. Should it have done so? Uh, it should have, yes. Um, didn't the record of poor audit results indicate that there were likely to be clients in need of remediation? Uh, in my view, yes. And how could ANZ determine whether any of Mr A's customers suffered loss if it didn't have the files? Uh, it, it would be very difficult unless there was sufficient information on the electronic um, system. You say in your statement that ANZ and Millennium 3 decided to continue dealing with the 2013 complaint and address any other matters as they arose. That's right. So ANZ left it to other customers, including the four it had identified as having self-managed super in funds that have made, had made investments. ANZ left it to each of them to make complaints. Yes. Should it have done that? No, I don't believe so. It should have, um, based on the information provided in the complaint, it should have uh, reached out to those four customers and found out what was going on. So ANZ put the onus on the customers to come forward and prove that they had suffered a loss as a result of Mr A's conduct? Uh, it appears so, yes. Instead of using its own resources to work out whether any of those customers had received bad advice? Yes. it. it um there was a couple of um, people within Millennium 3 that, that checked the X-Plan system to see whether they could find evidence of any communication or <laughs> advice. Um, but apart from that, uh, you're right. And it didn't use any of its resources to work out wh whether any of Mr A's clients had been the victim of fraud? No, not to my knowledge. And in September 2014, remembering that this response to the client's complaint was in December 2013. In September 2014, Millennium 3 entered into a deed of release with the customers who had made the complaint? Yes. And that complaint was settled for $50,000? Yes. Uh, and after that, ANZ closed the matter? Yes, it did. Were you aware that in July 2015, there were articles in the media about Mr A? No, I wasn't aware. You weren't aware that there were articles reporting that another licensee, um, through Mr. Mr A, through another licensee, had engaged in conduct that resulted in the payment of compensation of over $1 million to his former customers? No, I wasn't aware. I wasn't in the business and didn't know this particular advisor, but I wasn't aware of those things. Do you know if anyone within Millennium 3 was aware of that at that time? I, d I don't know that. 
Does ANZ have a system for identifying information like that in relation to its current or former advisers? Um, I, I don't know of the specific system. Uh, if we do. You don't know if you have such a system? No, not for media releases and the like, I'm not sure. Do you accept that uh, the media attention that was given to the payment of compensation to Mr A's clients through another licensee was another indication that ANZ should have investigated the advice that Mr A gave to his clients when he was an authorised representative of Millennium 3? Uh, I haven't seen the media release and I don't know the information that was provided through the media. Uh, um, but assuming that gave the level of detail, then, then yes, that would be another trigger point that we should investigate further, yes. In 2016, did ANZ receive two complaints from other former clients of Mr A? Yes. And one of them related to the same unit trust that I've asked you questions about? It did, yes. And between May and September 2017, ANZ received complaints from another eight former customers of Mr A? That's right, yes. And they related to unauthorised withdrawals or transfers from self-managed super funds and investments in the unit trust? Yes. And in August 2017, ANZ appointed an independent forensic accountant to conduct an investigation into Mr A's conduct? Yes, it did. That was um, McGrath Nicol that provided a report? Correct. In December 2017? Yes. Uh, can I take you briefly to their report, which you've exhibited to your statement as Exhibit 49, ANZ 800 346 0828? I ask that you turn to 0840 in that report. So having conducted its investigation, McGrath Nicol set out its understanding of what had happened. Yes. And you see uh, at the top of the first column all of the affected clients were self-managed superannuation funds that had been formed on the recommendation and with the acti active assistance of Mr A. Yes. The trustees of the SMFs were variously individuals or family companies. Yes. Uh, and do you see there's a heading there that's been redacted, but which is the name of the unit trust? the first heading uh, redacted on the left-hand side of the page. Sorry, the first heading. Redacted. Yes, so perhaps if I just direct you to the unredacted redacted te text. Oh. During June and July 2011, Thank you, yes. Mr A approached several of the affected clients with the opportunity to invest in a property. Yes. Mr A represented to the parties that a purchaser of the property had been unable to complete the contract and the property was available to them for a song, putting a value of $2.2 million on the property. The stated investment concept, as we've already discussed, was to purchase the property with a cash payment of $496,500 due in August 2011, with the balance of the purchase price being funded by an interest-free loan from the ANZ, secured by a mortgage over the property repayable in 18 months. Yes. There was no mortgage registered by the ANZ Bank against the property. Rather, there was a mortgage <coughs> registered by the vendor securing the balance of the purchase price. Yes. Um, now, If I could ask you to look at the following page, 0841. <clears throat> and 
and just before I do that, I'm sorry, I should have taken drawn your attention to a portion on the previous page. If we could just go back to 0840 <coughs> briefly. Just want to draw your attention to an, another aspect of the misconduct, which is referred to on the right hand side of the page. In addition, do you see that? Yes. In addition, Mr A borrowed $100,000 from certain clients in their personal capacity as distinct from their superannuation fund, which they understood was to assist with the settlement of the purchase and to cover for one of the investing parties who was unable to access funds within the required period. The clients advised that they expected these funds to be repaid quickly within 10 to 14 days. These funds were ultimately repaid by Mr A using funds withdrawn by him without authorisation from another superannuation fund bank account, unbeknownst to the clients. Yes, that's right. Then if we go to 0841. <coughs> oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I want to take you to the paragraph we are advised that Mr A ultimately came to the investors advising them of the external administrator's actions and proposed strategies to meet the obligation. We understand from a number of the affected clients that Mr A appeared to be quite panicked at that time. At no stage did Mr A advise the investors that the unit trust did not own the property or that the trust may not have been legally formed. These circumstances were discovered by the affected clients through their own later inquiries. That's right, yes. And then on 0842, uh, under transfers between affected clients, we have confirmed a number of funds transfers between affect affected clients. All transfers between affected clients other than two small transfers between one superannuation and another were found to be unauthorised and made without the knowledge of the parties. Yes. Now, having received this report, ANZ decided to have its advice review team review the advice given by Mr A to 103 customers during his time as an authorised representative of Millennium 3. Uh, as, a, as an initial uh, phase, my understanding is that the remediation team is looking specifically at the complaints raised, uh, priority one. Priority two is to then um, exp um, look across Mr A's portfolio at uh, customers with similar characteristics so that, that uh, were investing in self-managed super funds or had this Macquarie cash account um, uh, and that, that equates to 103, and that, that is sort of phase two, if you like, of the remediation, and that's because they're seen as the most likely customers to have been affected by this type of conduct. Uh, and then um, that they are scoping how much further they need to go in respect of uh, the entire portfolio. So you say in your statement that the 103 customers were selected because they were associated with a self-managed super fund, a corporate entity, a corporate trustee or family trust, these being the customers that were thought to be at higher risk of being affected by the conduct of Mr A, is that right? Yes. Does ANZ know how many customers were affected by Mr A's conduct? Uh, not, not yet. You've identified at least eight? Uh, at least eight, yes. And uh, do you not know how many customers were affected because the advice review team is still reviewing the customer files? Uh, I understand that to be the case, yes. They're still going through the remediation process. And ANZ has now notified the Western Australian Police of allegations made by three of Mr A's customers that between March 2011 and February 2012, Mr A withdrew funds from their accounts totalling $234,590 without their authority? Um, yes, I just haven't got that reference, but I'm sure... That's, that's at paragraph 44 of your statement, uh, Mr Ford. Thank you. I'm sure that's right. That's right. That's right? Yes. 
Do you accept that Mr A's misconduct ought to have been identified by ANZ earlier, Mr Ford? Yes, I, I accept that. Um, I think there was uh, enough information in the initial complaint in 2013 to warrant us um, on Millennium 3 talking to those uh, other, other customers at that time. So ANZ elected not to undertake an investigation in 2013 or to contact any of the customers who were in the same position as the customers who'd made the complaint? That appears so, yes. Um, you can't say why ANZ didn't take those steps at that time? No, I, don't, I mean, the, the, the only logical reason is that, um, you know, there was some, it was the commercial interests of Millennium 3 um, that, that uh, took precedent. Over the interests of the clients? Yeah, I think, that, I think that's fair. Has ANZ uh, changed any systems or processes in relation to um, the matters that we've touched on? Uh, yes, the, um, for the self-employed um, channels, there was a couple of changes that uh, they, they brought in um, as a result of um, this situation and, a, and another situation um, similar but different to it. Um, and that requires um, that when the advice assurance officers are, are reviewing files that they keep a lookout for associated um, uh, 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 authorised reps who might have other associated uh, businesses or, or the like, uh, the same as Mr A had here. Um, and for the practice development managers, there's also a risk assessment uh, that they do when they visit practices um, to ask questions about um, um, these sort of matters that might give rise to a conflict of interest. In circumstances where an advisor has been terminated with extremely poor audit results and there are then complaints alleging that he's misled or deceived customers, um, do you accept that the community would expect that a licensee would conduct an investigation to see if other customers have suffered detriment? Uh, yes, I think that's reasonable. But that did not occur in this case? No and you can offer no explanation for why it did not occur, Mr Ford? No, I can't. No further questions, Commissioner. Thank you, Ms Orr. Any party other than ANZ seek leave to cross-examine Mr Ford? Ms Williams? There's nothing arising, Commissioner. Might Mr Ford be excused? Thank you very much. Mr Ford, you may step down. You are excused. Commissioner, uh, we sought a statement from uh, another entity in relation to the topic of improper conduct by financial advisers. That entity was CBA. Uh, could I attend to the statement of Marianne Perkovic, dated 13 April 2018, which is CBA 9000 0016001. That will be Exhibit 2.196. Commissioner, that concludes the evidence in relation to improper conduct uh, by uh, financial advisers. The next topic that we will turn to relates to the disciplinary regime in relation to financial advisers, and the first witness will be a consumer witness. Uh, would the Commissioner give us a moment so that ANZ may leave the bar table? Uh, yes, if I come back at quarter to one. <laughs>